Picture it. Sicily, 1921. An elderly gentleman amounts a certain amount of recognition in his village and starts being looked up to by a small group of individuals. In order to keep his status and position at the top of his area of expertise, while at the same time taking inspiration from the wonderful Wizard of Oz's titular wizard and having other people do his work for him, he concocts a plan. He's going to take 12 of his best followers, further showing how strong his god complex was, throw them all in a house together, make them do silly tasks to entertain him, while not allowing them to talk unless someone's watching. After each task, he would shame whom he deemed as the worst, until there was only one person remaining. That person, riddled with what we now call Stockholm Syndrome, would go on to praise the said man. Not all of his followers would end up shamed. Some of them would be helped by the town folk. Some would save themselves from such fate. However, some would be completely ostracized by their own and left to fend for themselves, while the hordes of people that heard of the man's little games and were fascinated by them kept on praising him and giving him support to further his terrible tyranny. You know that thing when you watch a movie or a TV show, when you read a book or listen to an album and you start sympathizing with the villain? They become the villain that you root for, either because their motivation, their drive, their story appeals to you, or is objectively more morally correct than what the protagonists are doing. Yeah, that's how I feel about the majority of the quote-unquote villains on Drag Race. The irony being that the actual villain is the showrunner himself. RuPaul. Recently, in order to further push the blame on the people that make him money, RuPaul released a single called Blame It on the Edit, ridiculing the notion that the queens have been saying for the past couple of years. What we see on the show is not actually them, it's an edited version of them. Now, to me, that is very obvious, but many people have just been like, yeah, true work. Another channel, one of the best amongst the channels on here that post about Drag Race, named Top RPDR Videos for a reason, already covered the nonsense that is this song, with them pointing out instances when the show legitimately screwed over the queens, with some instances even being admitted by the show. Essentially, they pointed out all the different types of instances when, yes, the edit was to blame. Here in this video, I'm going to do something a little broader. I'm just going to talk about why this idea of blaming it on the edit is a cop-out that RuPaul is trying to sell is nonsensical by design, given that RuPaul's Drag Race is a reality TV show. Now, you might be like, but wait, if it's a reality show, then it must be portraying reality and nothing but reality. Well, here's the thing. TV shows, as stupid as this may sound, are a form of art. All art conveys a certain type of a reality. This reality, more often than not, is not the objective reality, whatever that may be, but the reality that the creator wants you to buy into. If you think I'm bullshitting you here, just Look at literature. When you say of reality, you may think of realism or even naturalism. However, any book you've ever read, any work of fiction that is, also portrays a certain type of a reality that we only get a tiny glimpse of. Let's take Harry Potter, for example. Obviously, the things portrayed there are not real, but they are real to the characters in the said books. Thus, that's a certain reality that we, the readers, are buying into. However, we know that it's not our reality. And one of the reasons why we know that is because, again, we only get a very small portion of it. In his book, Rajuela, an Argentinian writer, Julio Cortázar, points out that there is this sort of absurdity to life and human relationships. The only reality we will ever fully be able to comprehend and learn is our own. But being alive means that we're going to try to learn as much as possible about other people's realities, which we will never be able to do fully. What does this have to do with Drag Race? Well, 
let's see. The contestants on that show first have to spend more money than usual to prepare for the show. Thus, from the start, warping their realities. When they get on the show, they're locked up in their hotel rooms and are not allowed to talk to the outside world, to the other contestants, or to the production for the most part. Thus, not being able to have human contact. However, the only time they can actually talk to other people is during the filming of the show. When they're not shooting, the contestants can be in the same room, for example, but they cannot talk, so as to not resolve any issues or even create new ones that the cameras won't catch, meaning so as to not disrupt the structured narrative of the season. So by the design of the show, we're not watching what we may call the objective reality, but rather a narrative that the editors, the producers want us to experience. It might seem redundant that I'm going into these details here, but just think of how many people take this show seriously. It's alarming to say the least. Now you might be like, but wait, why is that alarming? Excluding the obvious horrible ways these people treat the queens, it's alarming because these people think that each one of those contestants' days of filming an episode can properly be edited down to just like 40 minutes to an hour. If it were only one contestant, I mean, sure, but you still lose those other 23 hours of their day. But here we're talking about sometimes up to 14 people. Add on to that the judges and what they say, and then add on to that what all those people say to each other, and you get a whole lot of stuff that never makes the air. Let's not forget another layer of this. The queens that are on the show are not in, let's call it a realistic reality. As I've already mentioned, the contestants don't have contact with the outside world. They seldom have contact with each other. They spend half of their day completely alone. Now, I know someone in the comments will write, Oh my god, I spend my days alone watching YouTube videos. Baby, that, that's not healthy. Uh, please go outside and see another person. To make matters worse for these contestants, they're in a competition, so their emotions are already amped up to an 11. Next, they're expected to spend multiple hours in drag, which as we know is very uncomfortable, and have people that are being paid a lot more than they are judge them. I wanted to say judge their art, but no, sometimes they even judge the contestants, their personalities, their abilities, and so on. And of course, let's not forget that the other queens may or may not come after you for whatever reason. Let's also not forget the confessionals. It's well known that there, the queens are asked questions about the show and other contestants by the producers. And those, said confessionals, can always be used to construct a narrative different to what's actually being presented. Alaska, famously on All Stars 2, spoke slowly and very little in the confessionals, so that the show could not use her words against her. So, to recap, the contestants are in a warped reality that's highly emotional, highly competitive, and highly fabricated by design. They're lacking proper human contact and lose their daily routines when going on the show. There's no time to rest for them, and if they're allowed to speak, everything they say is being recorded and may or may not be used against them, adding on to the stress. The show has also been caught many times using confessionals from different days to portray someone as a villain. Something that's a little harder to do now that the queens always look the same in the confessionals, but it's not impossible. Lastly, we're only allowed to see some 40 minutes to an hour of those queens and of what actually happened to a certain group of people in one or two days. So yes, we can blame it on the edit, 100%. Let's now look at the lyrics of the song. The intro goes as follows. All these shows around the world and everywhere we go, you'll never meet another bitch as salty as these hoes. Here, RuPaul tries to sell us on this idea that, oh my god, only on his show do the contestants blame what's being shown on the edit. Now I can very easily show you how incorrect this is. So, Survivor, winners at war. During a couple of episodes of the show, Wendell was portrayed as one of the villains. Why? Well, he got to be on the same tribe as Michelle, his ex, 
and as Michelle would end up being in the top three of that season, she had to be shown as the good guy that we root for. Wendell, as, let's say, collateral damage, was an easy target to be shown as the bad guy, even though both Michelle and Wendell have said that there was very little, almost no bad blood between them there. With this in mind also, knowing that he's supposed to be the bad guy, the show excluded a scene where Wendell talked to Sarah about police brutality in the US. As you can see here, Wendell is black, and if you didn't know, Sarah is a cop who has this flag in her house. I'm not going to say anything or point any fingers, but I think we know who the real villain is here. The first verse basically just says, don't bite the hand that feeds you. Listen, if the hand that feeds me also belongs to the person that's beating the shit out of me with their other hand, yeah, you know, I may bite back. One of the lines here goes, if you want to be pointing a finger, just know that the other four pointing at you. So, uh, firstly, I have a question, just logistically. How can you point at something and have your thumb pointing back at you? L like, no, 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 just try it right now. Unless you're like double jointed there, it's pretty impossible. <laughs> That's why when I point at something, I do it like Victoria Beckham, so no fingers are pointing at me. <laughs> Ain't nothing scripted what they sayin'. I mean, uh, again, that's just not how reality shows work. There is a scripted outline of each episode. Then, there are people that are there just to write out everything that each queen says, so that later, they can do what? Create a script. Old Man Rue ends this verse by, again, blaming the queens for saying the things they have said, even though, again, it all happened in a highly stressful, highly unrealistic situations. The rest of the song just kind of repeats the same notions. However, the final line is very telling. Only fuck with bitches all-star material. Basically, RuPaul ends the song by saying that, hey, if you want to have a job on the TV as a drag queen, you have to suck up to me and keep your mouth shut. And so, maybe we'll invite you to do All-Stars, where we can torment and exploit you yet again. I wanted the last section of this video to be me responding to comments on Top RPDR videos video that defend RuPaul or completely miss the point of their video, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave this one comment here for you all to see. In order to say that if you think what RuPaul is doing isn't right, you're not alone. That's it. That's the video. Thank you for watching.